it's coming through you never knew you never knew how much it me when you spoke to me but everyone needs something talk about the Hudson River and how the Hudson River was formed. As someone who's grown up in the Hudson Valley, I've always had an appreciation for the Hudson River. Being able to go watch the sunset, go kayaking, boating, or sitting by the water, setting up my hammock by the water, and it's only a few minutes from my house. It wasn't until I went to college to study geology that I learned the details about how the Hudson River was formed. But a little bit of a background, it's a 315 mile river that starts in the Adirondacks in a little lake called Lake Tier in the Clouds. It starts out as a little stream and it goes all the way down through eastern New York State and it goes down to the city. If you've been to New York City or if you live in New York City, you obviously have seen the Hudson River. Maybe you have taken a train up state or maybe you live upstate and you've taken a train to go down to the city. Either way, you're probably familiar with the river. The river ends down by the city and it goes out into the Atlantic Ocean. And actually the Native American name, Mahikantuck, I don't know if I said that right. That name actually means the river that flows two ways. And that's because the river flows north and south based on the tides of the ocean. So the geologic story of the Hudson River starts out with the Laurentide Ice sheet, a giant ice sheet that used to cover a lot of North America. This was during the last ice age. Hard to say the actual age of the ice sheet. So the last ice age was during the Pleistocene and the Pleistocene was 2.6 million to 11,500 years ago. This was when the last glacial maximum occurred. So the last glacial maximum was when all of that ice was at the farthest south it was gonna go before it started retreating back. The farthest extent of the Laurentide ice sheet was a little bit south of New York City. That was the extent of it, but then it would retreat when temperatures would fluctuate and get a little warmer. So it would would melt a little bit and it would retreat back north a little but then it would come back back and forth a few times so just think of an ice cube it expands when it's colder and it shrinks when it's warmer just like an ice sheet this ice sheet by the way was about two miles tall it's kind of hard to imagine something that big but if you compare two miles tall to the empire state building that's almost nine empire state buildings it's hard to even fathom that there being that much ice above us and you can see a lot of the evidence most places in new york of this ice sheet glacial lakes all the great lakes were formed by the ice sheet some streams and rivers also were old meltwater pathways and there's a lot of sediment that was left behind the glaciers. When the Laurentide ice sheet finally retreated back north for the last time, it started forming these things called proglacial lakes. Proglacial lakes basically means that these lakes formed kind of in front of the glacier as the ice sheet was moving back north. So as the ice sheet was moving back north, a lot of the ice started to melt and the water would fall either from the top of the ice sheet or through it in, in different areas of the ice sheet fall there'd be like huge rivers running through the ice sheet or on top of it going down onto the land as this ice sheet scraped back north and retreated so these lakes were left behind that at first they were dammed by the ice so at first the water was all left behind the one side from the glacier and then the other side would be dammed by sediment that was left behind by the glacier. So when the glacier eventually left, these lakes would be left behind and they'd be held in by these huge amounts of sediment because glaciers and ice sheets carry a lot, a lot, a lot of sediment, dirt, uh, pebbles, cobbles, all the way up to huge boulders. All of those sediment blocked in all that water left behind that melted off the glacier. And these lakes stayed lakes for a bit of time as the ice sheet retreated back. Eventually, Though, the sediment couldn't hold all this water and all this other sediment in these lakes so one by one these lakes ended up flooding and these dams broke and the water and sediment rushed out of them when all of these lakes needed to empty they needed to flood somewhere they needed a pathway to go so this pathway that they found was this channel that was originally carved by the Laurentide ice sheet as it was retreating back north the original channel of the Hudson River is believed to have 
been carved by that ice sheet moving north. When these lakes eventually flooded, that's the channel that they found. The Hudson River was carved even more by these huge floods. These floods were actually called catastrophic floods. That's how big they were. These lakes were bigger than the current Great Lakes that we have now. They were either bigger or about the same size. They occurred in a period of thousands of years because each lake flooded at a different time. When a lake flooded, the dam would break, the water and sediment would flood out and it'd be a catastrophic flood. And then there'd be a steadier flow of water down that channel for maybe like hundreds of years until the next flood. Certain lakes were bigger than others and had more water and sediment, therefore those lakes would have more catastrophic floods. Those are probably the floods that had the most influence on the further carving of the Hudson River Channel. The estimated discharge of these floods were 100,000 to 200,000 cubic meters per second. Wow. For comparison, the discharge of the Amazon River, I believe, is about 200,000 cubic meters per second, and Niagara Falls has a discharge of 2,400 cubic meters per second. It's hard to wrap your mind around that, just like it's hard to wrap your mind about there being almost two miles of ice on top of where we are now. So there were two specific floods that scientists believe had the most influence on the Hudson River, the carving of the channel that we see today. These two specific floods are what scientists believe were responsible for breaking down this sediment dam that was near New York City. The sediment dam was formed when the Laurentide ice sheet retreated. It was an old moraine. A moraine is a line of sediment left by an ice sheet or a glacier as it moves back. So once this sediment dam was broken by these catastrophic floods, the waters from these floods were able to flow out to the Atlantic Ocean. So at the time, the Atlantic Ocean was still actually a little bit farther out than it is today, but this coastline used to be different because the Laurentide ice sheet hadn't fully melted yet at the time of these floods. When the Hudson River initially formed, scientists believe that channel didn't end where it ends today. The Hudson River actually ended a little bit farther out where the current continent shelf is. So that's the information that I've gathered from how the Hudson River was formed. Whether you live near the Hudson River like I do or you have only visited New York once or you've never been to New York, I hope you learned a little something from this video and I hope that it makes you want to learn a little bit more about the geology of New York State and the world. Thank you for watching. Bye.